Well, uh, we're going to move right on. It won't take too long, but uh, our main speaker is next. And apart from my family, my very best friend in life was a man named Pastor David L. Vukish. And uh, Brother Vukish is now with the Lord. He went home to be with the Lord on February the 9th, 2015, at the age of 64 years old. I miss him more than I can put into words. Many of you met him and you knew him. I don't hold many funerals. I'm a preacher, but I'm an evangelist, an itinerant preacher. I travel. Usually pastors hold funerals, but uh, I, uh, I was the one that held the funeral of uh, Brother Bukish, my best friend, and uh, that's on YouTube. If any of you would be interested to uh, look at that, it's, it's, uh, I'm not going to get into all that's there, but it, you can see it on YouTube. And uh, he spoke at these banquets right here. I don't know how many of you remember Brother Bukish speaking here. Only a few of you, see. Uh, well, these banquets began in 1999. We started in 19. This is our 21st year, and uh, from from the year 2001 to 2009. Bukas was here every year for those years, 2001, 2009, except one year, 2006. And I spoke because he, uh, he had some things back home that kept him back there. But one time he invited me to speak at his graduation service at the Youngwood Baptist School at Big Swickley Baptist Church where he pastored out in western Pennsylvania. Uh, I know I was there in 1996. My oldest daughter, Jennifer, graduated that year. And I spoke at the graduation at Brother Bukas's school and church. And then I was back there. I thought, uh, I thought Brother Ross's daughter was graduating kindergarten that year, but we figured it wasn't so. But in 1998, my daughter Lisa, who's here tonight, graduated from that same school along with a fellow named Paul Abraham. Now, you've got to stay with this story. Lisa and Paul Abraham graduated in 1998. And uh, that's where I first met Brother Ross, who I'm about to introduced to you tonight, Brother uh, Bob Ross, uh, I believe it was uh, at the school, and he used to go there and preach at the chapel for the young people, and we don't know the exact minute and time and second it happened, but that's where I met Brother Ross, and Brother Bukas spoke highly of him, and I got to know him uh, back then, uh, just uh, occasionally, but I got to know him. Then in 2002, my youngest daughter, Sarah, who Brother Ross brought with him this year, she graduated from high school also, but her graduation service was right here at the Elkdale Baptist Church, as was my son Joseph's, and Sarah graduated with pastor's son, Joseph, who's here tonight, and his twin sister, Melody, and so that was in 2002. Now, all of my children were actually homeschooled, but when it came time for graduation, they got their diplomas and their graduation ceremonies at these two different established Christian schools, Brother Bukas's school in the Youngwood Baptist Academy and Brother Bissell School. Uh, two, of, two of my, my oldest two graduated from Brother Bukas' school. My youngest two graduated here from our church. Now later in time, Sarah, my youngest daughter, and Paul Abraham, who graduated with Lisa out Western Pennsylvania, got together. And they got married in, in 2010. And uh, Sarah moved to Western Pennsylvania, where she lives now with her husband Paul. Paul and Sarah have been members of the Heritage Baptist Church in Jeanette, Pennsylvania, where Brother Ross is pastor for about eight years now. And uh, so Brother Ross has been pastor there for 21 years, uh, almost in May. He said he'll be 21 years there. And he also has a Christian school there, uh, Heritage Baptist Academy, from grades kindergarten all the way to grade 12. And him and his wife Tammy, not Tracy, but Tammy, I'm going to keep doing that, they have three children, and Emily is their oldest, then Rebecca, I believe, is their second, and then Bobby is their youngest, and he, that's their son, who graduated last year from high school and now wants to be a state police officer, Brother Joe Bissell, wherever you are. Where's Joe Bissell? Is he here? Joe Bissell? Oh, he's back in the corner. And so uh, Pastor Ross's son uh, wants to be a, a police. Uh, you know what he's going to go through at the academy, right? And uh, even though I have known Brother Ross occasionally for quite a few years, and my son-in-law and daughter are members of his church, I've never heard him preach. I've never heard the guy preach in my life. I knew him. I knew Vuka said he was a good man. He preached, and I, but I never heard him. Every time I visited my daughter and went to his church, he had a guest speaker <laughs> or an evangelist, and uh, I, I never heard him preach. But the last time I was out there, I got to hear him preach. 
And I was greatly blessed by the message that I heard. I said to my wife on the way home, I said, I believe the Lord would have me to invite that guy to come and speak to our hunters back with. And I prayed about that, and I gave him a call. Now, uh, knowing that he's a busy pastor and had come a long distance to get here, many, many miles, pretty near 300 one way, he's going to have a round trip of close to 600 miles and uh, about 8 or 10 hours on the road. Uh, I wondered if it would be possible. I wasn't sure if he'd be able to do it. But obviously it was the Lord's will, amen. <laughs> and the Lord led me that way. I called him and he was uh, enthused about coming. And the main reason I wanted this brother to come tonight is because I believe with all my heart that he loves the Lord. I'm sure of that. He loves the Word of God. He has a Bible. He believes he has the inerrant, infallible, absolute truth of God. And if I didn't believe that, I'd go back into a rock and roll band because my whole life was changed based on that book. That's God's book, and there's no mistakes in it. I'm talking about the King James Version, too. Amen. I'll make it real clear. And Brother Ross uh, believes the same. And he loves to preach. I, all, I believe that you'll be blessed if you uh, listen carefully as he's going to come and give us what uh, I believe is the most important part of this event tonight. I believe this is the most important part right now. Uh, this night can make the difference as to where you're going to spend eternity. And that's very important. And Brother Ross is about to give us the most important meal that we could ever partake of. And the best food you'll ever get. He's going to give you the Word of God. And again, I'm going to remind you, he's also going to be speaking tomorrow all day at the church. 10 o'clock in the morning at Sunday school, 11 o'clock in the morning service, and 7 o'clock in the evening service. And then they'll go back to Western Pennsylvania at night. Now, everybody is welcome. It's not a closed circuit place here. You're all welcome to come back and hear this dear brother speak again. I'm sure you're going to be blessed as he comes right now and shares what God has laid upon his heart. Brother Ross, Thank you. come speak to us. Thank Appreciate you, you brother. Thank you. Well, I wish I had some stories like the trapping stories and the hunting stories. I don't have any great stories like that about hunting. Um, I want to just say a few things and I want to say uh, a special thank you to, to Pastor Bissell for having Tammy and I in. It's an honor to be here, and I, I don't take it lightly. And thank you so much for extending this opportunity to speak to this, this group of folks and, and for tomorrow as well. I want to thank you, Brother Riccardi, for thinking of me and, and for extending the invitation. I want to thank the Elk Dub Baptist Church for hosting this, this, this meeting tonight. Uh, the food uh, ladies, thank you for putting it all together for us and all the folks that, uh, that had a part in that. Thank you for the delicious food. Uh, especially thank you to the folks that had uh, the desserts. Amen. That was awesome. There, so. Good stuff. Um, I, I talk fast. I understand that uh, when I first got to our church 20, about 21 years ago, there was a, an older gentleman in the church. He said, preacher, he said, listen to you preach is like trying to get a drink out of an open fire hydrant. He said, <laughs> he said there's so much coming out so fast. He said, sometimes it's tough to get the cup under the spigot there. So I, I, I feel like I'm always at a great, uh, a great advantage when I'm given an amount of time to speak because I do speak a little quick. Uh, I can get a lot more in. So I'm going to talk quick. If you listen quick, we'll be over with quick. Does that sound good? I know you've heard some good stories, and boy, I tell you what, my admiration for everything. I've just heard your testimony about the blessing is the blessing is the trial. Boy, I tell you what, uh, for you that know the Lord Jesus Christ, that that is a truth that was worth coming to the meal for right there. And we all go through them. We all live godly in Christ Jesus. I'll suffer persecution. We understand that, and in this world you shall have tribulation. We understand that. So Christians, that was that was really good. I'm, I'm not going to be very long tonight, but I, if I can just have your attention, uh, Brother Cardi was not, was not over-dramatizing that truth uh, about the importance of what I'm going to share with you. I'm not important. If you forget my name, big deal. But if you walk out of here not knowing Jesus Christ, and I'm not just talking about knowing that there was a man named Jesus that was born of a virgin that died on a cross. I mean, if that's all you know about him, if you don't know him, then, then you've lost everything. And I, I, you, you, I cannot make too much about the subject I'm going to talk about. So I'm just going to ask you, just for a few minutes, if you can just give me your attention. Again, not because I'm worthy, but because the subject is worthy. You don't know me. If you knew me, uh, you'd know that I, I, I try to love the Lord as best I can. I'm an imperfect man. I'm not standing up here to, to, tonight before you I'm trying to model perfection. I'm not a perfect man. I, I got saved. I, I came to faith in Jesus Christ as a 13-year-old boy. Uh, lived for the Lord for a while. was on fire. Uh, but then I... Uh, I, I fell away. I, I was prodigal for about eight years of my life. If you'd have seen me during those eight years, the last thing you'd have called me was a Christian. The words coming out of my mouth, the the attitude that I was carrying around, the, the just my demeanor was was so twisted because I was away from the Lord. I was miserable. I remember sitting in a bar in Baltimore during that time, and I just was sitting there, and it was just a point where 
I, I just couldn't get any enjoyment out of drinking anymore. It was just like the Holy Spirit was saying to me, what are you doing here? Are you having fun yet? And I had to admit to him at that point, I was not. I was not having fun away from the Lord. And I'll say this, if, if you've gone away from the Lord, uh, you, you, please tell me you're happy because you're not. You can't be happy away from the Lord. That's not, you'll never be happy away from the Lord once you know the Lord. And so let me just say that God does make a way back. I'm glad God's not just a God of the first chance or the second chance. But boy, I'll tell you what, in my life, it's like almost an everyday chance. I, I stumble, I fall. Uh, and, and God's good. God's a merciful God. And the Bible talks about His mercy endureth forever. That's the kind of mercy He has uh, toward His children. Uh, I was looking at the, 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 uh, the pamphlet, the flyer that was put out for the, uh, uh, for the meal tonight, and I saw the picture of the guest speaker on there. So if you're kind of looking for that guy, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm a little shorter, uh, a lot less hair, uh, so uh, I'm not that guy. And some of you maybe didn't look at the picture. You saw the name Bob Ross. You're expecting some guy with a big afro uh, with a paintbrush. Amen. That's not it either, amen. I'm, I'm another Bob Ross. Uh, uh, our church has a lot of fun with that. I came in one Sunday morning, and they had a Bob Ross bobblehead sitting on my pulpit for me, and they, they got a good chuck out of that. For Christmas one year, one of the families got me a, a Bob Ross Chia Pet. You know, the Chia. I still, to this day, have not put those seeds on his head because I'm jealous of the hair. So uh, I, I do struggle with that. Uh, but, uh, no, I, I have a little fun. And let me just say this. Uh, I, I'm so honored to be here tonight. I, I'm I've been preaching for all these years. I'll be, I still get nervous when I get behind the pulpit because I'm handling something that has the power to change eternity. I can't, but the Word of God can. And I remember where I was at when I heard, when I heard the news that saved my soul. I was at my grandma's house, 13-year-old boy. Um, we had gone over there to cut her grass. And my uncle, who would just recently gotten saved, had left two gospel tracks on an end table. They were in a comic book form. Uh, if you're familiar with Chick Tracks, there were two Chick Tracks laying on the, com on, on the coffee table, and I picked them up and began to read them because I like comic books. But I'll tell you what, I read some stories in there, and, and when it got to the end of the story, it really just challenged you to examine whether or not you're going to be going to heaven or not and, and, and what you've done with Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you what, it scared me. I had just gone through, I had grown up, grown up, and I'm not trying to knock on anybody, I grew up Lutheran. I just was went through my first Holy Communion, uh, went through all that, uh, but I was lost. I was religious, but I was lost. But that day I picked up those books. I realized for the first time why Jesus Christ died on the cross and why God raised him from the dead. And it was a 13-year-old boy named Bob Ross. And it made sense to me that day. God spoke to me that day and said, I did this for you. And he didn't do it just for me, but he did it, but it, but it made sense to me that day. And that day as a 13-year-old boy with nobody in the house but me and those two gospel tracts and the Holy Spirit, I got on my face. And I said, God, if Jesus Christ was willing to die for a sinner like me and you're willing to save me, I'd like to have Jesus Christ be my Savior. And I asked him to save me that day, and he came in and did that. I was all by myself. I didn't have a preacher with me. I didn't have a Sunday school teacher by my side or a vacation Bible school worker telling me that I was doing things right. I prayed, and I said, Jesus, I want to be saved. I believe you died on the cross. I want to be saved. And I got up and was going to go cut grass, and I said, what if I didn't pray that prayer right? Because I don't want to go to hell. I knew the consequences at that point. God had impressed that upon me. I knew there's only two destinations. I knew that I couldn't decide after I died, and so I only had this choice. And I got back on my face again the second time and prayed that same prayer. Lord, I don't want to die and go to hell. I want, I want Jesus' death to count for me, and I want Him to save me. And I said amen and prayed that little prayer in the back of the book as best I could and got up and was going to go cut grass again. I'm a little slow. What if He didn't hear me the first time and I didn't say it right the second time? And I did that five times. I told you I'm a little slow. The last time I got up from, from praying, uh, the Holy Spirit kind of spoke to me, and he didn't speak to me audibly, but I just kind of felt this way. He said, I heard you the first time. <laughs> That's my salvation testimony. I, I'm, not, I'm not standing before you today saying, I know I'm going to heaven. I'm not confident that I'm going to heaven and secure that I'm going to heaven because I'm a good man. I'm not. The Bible says, there's none that doeth good, no, not one. My goodness can't get me anywhere. Uh, I'm not going to heaven because I'm a Baptist preacher. A profession can't, a, a profession, a, a, a job can't save me. I'm not going to heaven because I have a copy of the Bible or many copies of the Bible. Friend, tonight I'm just going to share with you just a few things out of Scripture that I hope will speak to your heart. The only reason I know I'm going to heaven tonight is because I believe that when Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed that blood, that God accepted His death as full payment for all the sins I would ever commit. And not just for mine, but for the whole world. One of the great verses in all the Bible, you might have heard it, you might have seen it written. I know back in the 70s and 80s, those guys would go to the football games and they'd have their rainbow wigs on, they'd be holding up a sign uh, by, by the field goal post, and it'd say, John 3.16. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let me just give you a little background of that and, and, and just challenge you a little bit today. I, I ask this question of many people, and I've asked it of many people in my life. If you were to die right now, where would you spend eternity? A lot of people don't think about that. Most people, the only time they think about it, that is when they go to a funeral home. And they see that person laying in a casket, and they might ask the question, I wonder where he's at right now, I wonder what's going on right now, and a lot of people don't understand that. But I would like to challenge you with that. Are you sure you're going to heaven? And why, why would you carry that, that certainty around if you said yes to that question? You know, I meet a lot of people and I ask that question to. There are two responses I get that just break my heart. Are you sure you're going to heaven? Yeah, I, I'm sure I'll go to heaven. Well, how do you know that? What are you putting your confidence in? A lot of people tell me, well, I'm a good person. And I respond to them and, and I share scripture with them. But I, I, share that with, I share this with them. If you were good enough to get to heaven on your own, then why did God send Jesus Christ to die for you? If, if it was just a matter of our goodness and I... I share a little story with them. I, I can walk into a 7-Eleven store, a little convenience store, and try to pick up a, a nickel piece of bubble gum. If I put that nickel piece of bubble gum on the counter in front of the cashier, she's going to ring it up and say, that's five cents, sir. Well, my name's Bob Ross. I've been pastor in the Heritage Baptist Church for 21 years. I've been married for 30 years. I've got three children that I love and I've tried to raise right, and I try to drive the speed limit. Um, <laughs> I'm a chaplain or a local, I'm a chaplain at the nursing home. I've been working in a prison ministry for 17 years. I could, I, you know, I got good grades in school and I could go down and list every good thing I've done. She's not going to let me take the bubble gum because I'm a good guy. Because that's not the price on the bubble gum. The price on the bubble gum is five cents. A lot of people don't understand that the price on sin is not being a good person. The Bible says the wage of sin is death. If we're going to get to heaven, somebody's got to die for us. We can die ourselves, but we'll have to pay that price on sin off ourselves as well, being separated from God. Or we can realize that God paid the price for us in the greatest act of love that's ever been seen. A lot of people, if they don't give me that answer that I'm a good person, they'll say, well, I'm a Baptist, or I'm a Methodist, or I'm a Catholic, or I'm a Lutheran. It's not what denominational name tag you hang around your neck that's going to get you anywhere. I, uh, Billy Sunday was one of my favorite preachers. He was fond of saying this. He said, going to a church on Sunday doesn't make any more a Christian than walking into a garage makes you an automobile. <laughs> it's not where you sit on a certain day of the week that makes you what you are. It's what you've done with Jesus Christ. John's testimony in his, in, in his first epistle, he said this, This is a record that God had given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that has the Son has life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. See, the difference, it, it, it doesn't matter what you think about me. And, and I hope you think that I'm a good guy. I, I, I would try to earn that. If you got to know me better, I would like to think I'm a friendly person and, a, and an honest person and a, a straight shooter. I, I'd like to think that of myself. Sometimes I, I might not measure up uh, as completely as I'd like. But again, it doesn't really much matter what you think about the preacher. But what do you say about the one the preacher's talking about? The Bible tells us, and I'm just going to read you just a few verses, and I'm not going to be very long, but it's, it's in John 14, and, and I believe the Lord led me here for a reason tonight. The Bible says, and this is Jesus Christ speaking, He's comforting His disciples. He's just told them that He's going to go to Jerusalem, and that He's going to be betrayed, and that they're going to crucify Him, and He's going to die. You would think that maybe, I, I know that I would probably be focused on my own death, and my own upcoming sufferings, but Jesus was not concerned about Himself. He was concerned about those men that had followed Him for three and a half years. And so his comfort was not directed inwardly, it was directed outwardly at those that he loved. And here are the words that Jesus Christ gave them. He said in John 14, verse 1, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thank God for Thomas. Thomas spoke up and said, Lord, we... <laughs> We, we, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus answered him and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let me just share with you two points out of this, and I'll be done tonight. Thank you for listening. First thing that I see in this passage of Scripture is this. This, this one truth, and I want you to if it, leave with this on your heart tonight. It's this truth that God cares. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. God knows everything about you. He knows everything you've ever done. He's seen every step you've ever taken. He's considered every thought that's ever entered your mind. Everything you've ever looked at, God's seen too. Every sound that has ever entered your ears, guess what? God heard it too. And guess what? That's a little scary. Because I'll tell you what, these eyes have always been looking in the right direction. This mind's not always been thinking about the right things. 
These ears haven't always been listening to the right words and the right sounds. These feet haven't always gone in a good direction. These hands haven't always been involved in honest things. And yet God knows about all of them and God still cares. I want to, want to, one great verse in the book of Romans. The Bible says that God commendeth His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't wait for us to get better to love us. God loves us right where we're at. And, 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 and I don't want to say this to you tonight. God cares about you. God knows everything you're going through. God knows right where you're at right now, what you're struggling with, the, the storms that you're facing. I'll say more about that tomorrow. If you, if you get a chance to be here, I hope it'll be a blessing to you. But you know what? God loves you just like you are. And because God loves you just like you are, He loves you too much to leave you right where you are. He wants to do something for you. I thank, I thank God for Brother Accardi's uh, testimony. God loved him too much to leave him in that lifestyle. He wanted to make him something new. He wanted to make him something profitable for himself and, and so he could be a bigger blessing to those around him. And so he pulled him out of where he was. I heard a preacher say one time, God, God might find us in the hog pen, but he loves us too much to leave us in the hog pen. God cares about you. He cares about your marriage. He cares about your children. He cares about your community. He cares about our nation. I mean, God cares. Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. And, and, and as he expresses that care, he says, you know what? Just trust me. Just believe in me. And how, how can we trust a God we don't know? Well, God gave us a book called the B-I-B-L-E. A number of years ago, one of my dear friends uh, uh, took me to preach with him in prison. I went down to Moundsville, uh, maximum security prison in Moundsville, West Virginia. First time I've ever been to prison. And just like you see it on TV, it had the big iron doors, right? We go in there, and, and I'll be honest with you, I was terrified. Now my, my friend is a, is a missionary with Rock of Ages, and he's been in prisons all over the place, and I've been in a number of them, and I've been, I've been in the prison ministry for 17 years out of our local church, and so it's not that big of a deal to me, but I'll tell you what, the first time I was in there, I was terrified. He said, when we go in there, he said, you know what, you take nothing in, you take nothing out. If somebody tries to give you something, don't take it. He said, you take nothing in, nothing out. He said, when we're walking down the hallway, he said, make sure you stay right behind the CO, that's a corrections officer, and stay right behind me because i got a camera running right down the middle. I thought they had a you know, gun on you, you know, like on the TV, right? You know, If you step out, they're going to shoot you, and I'd be dead. My wife would never see me again and all that stuff, but that wasn't the case. But they just had to maintain integrity going down the hallway. So we got in there, we waited. The CO came out and said, it's time for you to come in. And those big iron doors, clunk, 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 and it, 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 it was open. And we walked through there. The CO invited us. We walked in there, and that big door started closing behind us. And bought a table, when that door closed shut, I wanted to cry for mommy, but I didn't think that would be too impressive for anybody in the prison. <laughs> So we walked down the hallway. I'm, I'll tell you what, I was as nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. I was just walking down there. I didn't want to step out of line. I was just trying to match the guy in front of me step, step for step. I didn't want to get out of line. I just nudged up to the wall. I was just trying to do everything. We get to the, to the, to the room where we're going to have the, the Bible study there, and I go in there, and my friend gets all things set up, gets the tracks out, and, and, and the Bible set out there, and, and the CO leaves the room, and it's just me and him in the room. I'm like, oh, this is not good. And then the guys start coming in. And I'm not real big. I'm five foot eight, uh, maybe, uh, on a good day. Um, and these guys start coming in. And he's, you know, my friend's howling with these guys. He's ministered to them before. He has a genuine love for them. They love him back. It was just, it did my heart good to see it, but I'm still terrified. I'm on their turf. I've never been here before. And I'm standing there with my back against the wall because I'm, that's me. Amen. And the biggest guy that came in the room, he's probably about six foot four, six foot five, just, just massive wall of humanity. He comes over to me. He said, you with Brother Roger? I said, I am. He said, let me ask you a question. I said, anything. He said, do you know what the Bible stands for? I'm thinking, whatever you say. <laughs> and this, this, man, this man said to me with a smile on his face, he said, the Bible stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. It's an instruction manual. It tells us what to do and what not to do. I've got a bunch of men in here. We're men, right? I get something, I take it out of the box, plug it in, and I'm, I'm going, right? I don't read instruction manuals. That might work with electronics sometimes. That does not work with life. If we don't read the instruction manual, guess what? We are, we are headed for breakdown. We're headed for trouble. Guys and ladies, God cares for you. God loves you. you you'll never walk away from that truth. Think, think about this, and I'll just share this, this truth with you. Hell tonight is full of people. And everybody in hell tonight is there unforgiven. But not one person is in hell tonight that went there unloved. If you go to hell, you're going to have to step over God's love, around God's love. You're going to have to ignore it and refuse it and rebel against it. You will not go to hell unloved. But God loves you enough to let you make the choice of where you'll spend eternity. You know, I don't, I, I don't think I've ever had to do this with my children. I, I've been blessed. 
I don't ever have to tell my children to t say, tell daddy you love him. They come up and tell me they love me because that's on their heart. I don't have to, Timmy, tell me you love me. I'll, I'll tease them. No, you don't. And we'll, we'll tease a little bit. But, you know, when she just comes up and says, I love you, that expression that's free means everything. See, God wants you to love him because you choose to love him. Now, God, you can't stop God from loving you. God's already proven that love. Every time you look at the cross, every time you consider the person of Jesus Christ, it's proof positive that God loves you. And he cares, he cares for you. And he died for you. Who died on the cross? It wasn't just a man died on the cross. It was God. Inhuman. Well, we call it incarnate. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glories of the only God and the Father, full of grace and truth. That means God decided to condescend to man. He came down and, 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 and willingly encapsulated his, his glory in human flesh. And it was God that died on the cross. Let me blow your mind a little bit if you haven't thought about this. Do you know who was responsible for the act of creation? It was God the Son. So the one that made us is the one that died for us. The one that paid the price for our sin. Uh, you're not going to find love like that anywhere in this world. God cares about you. God proves, God proves that care over and over and over again. God's good to us. Second thing I see in this, and I want to finish on this, not only does God care, but, but, but God's, God also prepares. What does it take to be a successful trapper? Preparation. What does it take to be a successful hunter or, or, or to hunt down the, the predators? I mean, they're smart. It's not like we're hunting rocks. You've got, to, you've got to consider the season and the laws. I mean, there's so much. Uh, th this meal was not just a, a meal by accident. A lot of preparation took place. Uh, the foods and, 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 the, and the invitations and just it, it took preparation. But we see God, it, it, God, God's preparation in this also. Jesus said this. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. Think about that for a second. God, right now... God the Son, Jesus Christ, is preparing a place for those that love Him, those that have caught up by faith to Him, so He can receive us unto Himself, so that He can be with us. He even said, in the next verse, He said, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Why is God preparing? He, he wants to receive us so we can be together. See, something happened along the way. When God made man, God, if you read the, the first chapter of Genesis, everything that God made, God saw that it was good. And when, he, when it came time on day six to make man, he made man in his image. And he made man special. And he breathed into the, 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 and Adam the, uh, the breath of life and, and, and put a living soul in us. And, and again, God, uh, uh, for how long we don't know, but he walked with man in the garden. And that was his habit to walk with Adam in the, in the garden in the cool of the day. And, but something happened along the way. Uh, the, the sin came in there. And the Bible tells us that the serpent beguiled Eve. And, and Adam, who was in charge of the garden, didn't... didn't take care of his responsibilities, and God laid the sin on him. And the Bible says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for they all have sinned. What does that mean? Uh, because Adam sinned, he, he severed our relationship with Almighty God. He broke fellowship with God. God took him out of the garden. God put a flaming sword there to keep him from coming back in. And, and again, God's original intent for creating man uh, to, to fellowship with him was destroyed. But what the first Adam did, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, restored. Think about what Jesus said in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ gave us the opportunity to walk with God and talk with God and to fellowship with God and to enjoy God again. What sin had, had taken away, Jesus Christ brought back to us. So that preparation there. And, and what, what, what about the preparation? Well, the, the, the preparation involves a place. A place called heaven. I, I, I've just been speaking for just a few minutes. We've been here since 5.30. What time is it now? Almost uh, almost 8? We've been here for a couple hours together. Maybe some a lot longer, ladies. But every second that ticks off that clock brings us a second closer to eternity. Some, a second closer to this prepared place called heaven. Unfortunately, to some who have not yet chosen Jesus Christ or humbled themselves and as a sinner called out and asked for mercy and asked for forgiveness and pardon a second closer to a, an eternal separation. That's frightening. Yes, sir. Not only preparation in a place, but the preparation of a plan. God had this plan of salvation drawn out, the Bible says, before the foundations of the world. I can't explain it to you because God's omniscience, God's ability to understand everything, God's wisdoms, uh, wisdom is so far above mine. 
The Bible says his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. But God in his wisdom, and because he's God, developed a plan to save us. That plan wasn't to make the right church to save us, or to make the right profession to save us, or to make the right amount of good works to save us, but he himself decided he'd be the sacrifice for us. The preparation in the place, yes, heaven's being prepared right now for those that love Jesus Christ and have received him. Uh, preparation in a plan, that plan was drawn out from before even Adam and Eve fell. And that plan's still in effect today. God paid it all. So you and I didn't have to pay a thing. I, I think it incredible when Jesus Christ died on the cross before he bowed his head and gave the ghost the Bible records for us that these were his last words. He said, it is finished. The Greek, tetelestai, means what the English says, it is finished. It means paid in full. When you walk out of a store and you've gone to the cashier and you've laid your money down and they give you that receipt, that was Jesus Christ saying, receipt's paid. I got the receipt right here. I've, I've paid it fully. You don't have to pay a thing because Jesus Christ paid it all. A prepared place, a prepared plan, and also a prepared way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I'm the way. If you want to go to heaven, there's only one way there. It's not through this church. Although this church can point you to the right one. They can get you on the right way. And I'm glad for the testimony of this church. It's not through a person, although people can tell us the right way. That, that, that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll notice there's no nail prints in my hands. I can't save you. I can't save myself, but Jesus Christ can completely. And he will save anybody that comes to him in faith. Pastor, you don't know what I've done, but God does. You know how far I've fallen away. I don't, but God does. And God's good. I was preaching in prison a number of years ago. God always runs me into these big guys. There was a number, probably about 40 guys in, in, in the Bible study I was conducting, and I... I preached a message of salvation like I'm preaching to you right now. And I asked them at the end of the message to bow their heads. And, and, and I, I, offered, I offered those that had not yet trusted Jesus Christ an opportunity to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And I told them this. I said, the prayer won't save you. You need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But when God hears you calling out in faith, God hears and God saves. And a number of men prayed and, and asked Jesus Christ to, 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 to be their Savior. And I said, if you were sincere about that, if you meant business with God, and I said, I have no, no way to tell. I said, but if you're sincere with God, I said, when this, when this is over, I want you to come up and shake my hand. And I'll tell you what, we, we closed in prayer. They, a number of guys came up and shook my hand. The biggest guy in the room was, was at the back of the line. He had tears in his eyes. I said, oh, I hope I didn't make him mad because I wasn't getting out of there. That room is closed. And he came up and he said, I looked down on me and I looked up at him like I'm pretty much inclined to do. He said, Preacher, he said, did you mean what you said? I said, every word. He said, you don't know what I've done. I said, I don't, but God knows everything. He said, Preacher, and he had, he had, he, he had tears just started flooding down his cheeks. I'm not embellishing. God knows. He had tears flooding down his cheeks, and this, he did this before everybody. I, for, for propriety's sake and for uh, just just to keep things... Uh, you know, as, as private as possible. When, when the guys asked Jesus Christ, I had them bow their heads and close their eyes so it could be a private moment with them and God. But this man with the whole entire room looking on, because he was somebody there, I guess, with tears coming down, he said, if God could forgive me for the sins I've done, I'd sure like to have him be my Savior. He said, Pastor, can you help me pray that prayer again? Because I want to trust him. And my, my way is not to embarrass anybody. But he said, I want to pray right now. I said, everybody's looking. He said, it's okay. And right there before God and everybody, that man, that big man, tears coming down his eyes, that, that truth hit his heart. He knew he was a sinner. He knew he was lost. He knew he couldn't save himself. And that man right there in front of God and everybody, all of his cellmates, called out and probably one of the sweetest prayers I've ever heard when he asked Jesus Christ to be his Savior. Maybe that's you tonight. Maybe, maybe we're, we're all pretty good about putting on, aren't we? I know we go to church and put on our church face, right? We might be fighting like cats and dogs on the way in, amen? We get to the church property and everything's all right, you know, in my father's house, right? We're pretty good about putting on, we're in public. We've got our public face on, our public persona on, but you know what? God looks right through that. He knows what's in your heart tonight. I'm not, I'm not asking you, are you a church member? I'm not asking you how faithful are you to church. I'm asking you what you've done with Jesus Christ because he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Now, if Jesus Christ is the way and the truth, then that statement's also got to be true. That no man comes unto the Father but by him, or he couldn't be the truth, and he wouldn't be the way. Right. Pastor Ross, I'm like Frank Sinatra. I'll do it my way. Uh, your way won't take you to heaven. Right. What will you do with Jesus Christ? You believe he died on the cross? The world will tell you that. 
Roman historians will tell you that. The ancient historian Josephus, the Jewish historian Josephus, even writes about the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. So that's not a real big thing to admit that Jesus Christ died on the cross. I think it's fascinating. The Romans put to death ten, tens of thousands of Jewish men on the cross. How is it history only remembers the name of one? That name Jesus is a unique name. Because he's a unique person. And he alone was God. What will you do with Jesus tonight? Pastor Ross, I'll, I'll think about it. You won't ever think about it as much as you are right now. I wouldn't take that chance on eternity. But if God's been speaking to your heart about trusting Jesus Christ, I promise you, with everything that's in my being standing here tonight, it'll be the most important decision you'll ever make because you'll look back in 10,000 years and say, I'm glad. Even though it wasn't a church service, there's some short guy from western Pennsylvania talked a million miles an hour. And I heard from God. And I trusted Jesus Christ. And you'll thank God, not for me, but for Him. Amen. What will you do with Jesus Christ? Hey, you say, Pastor Ross, I've got plenty of time. How do you know? How do you know that tomorrow is not the appointed time? The Bible says, it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. You say, Pastor Ross, you're putting a lot of pressure. This is a big deal. Amen. I'm not trying to get you to buy a used car. I'm not trying to get you to join the church, trying to get you to be religious. I'm saying, what will you do with Jesus Christ? Receive Him? I'll tell you what, it'll be the best decision you ever made. It'll be the start of something incredible. You can reject Him, and God's still going to love you. You'll probably still experience good things in your life, but you know what? There's, there's, there's a reckoning coming. And when you draw your last breath, it'll be too late to take care of that. And God will have no choice at that point, but say, you chose this. How will you choose today? This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. This life is in His Son. He that has His Son has life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. John even puts it a little more bluntly in, in John chapter 3. He said, the wrath of God abideth on Him. The only way to get that wrath off, the only way to get the favor of God on, is by humbling yourself and saying, I know I'm a sinner. I know that Christ died for me. I want His death to count as payment for my sins. And call upon Him in just simple and faith. Dear Jesus, I believe You died for me and I want You to be my Savior. The way You word that, that's between You and God. But it's that faith that God's looking at. The Bible says about faith is impossible to please God. That's why we've got to believe that He is and we've got to come to Him in faith. How will it be with your soul? Brother Cardi, I'm going to let you take the invitation at this point and just as you see fit. But I want to thank you for being such good listeners. I didn't mean to go long tonight. I hope that you understand the, the urgency. I didn't come 300 miles because it was when he asked, I told the Lord I'd go anywhere that, that the Lord called me to go to go preach. I, I don't believe I'm here by accident. I don't believe that the message I preached tonight was by accident. I believe there's somebody that needed to hear it tonight. If that's you, please. God made some big preparations to get me here and to get you here. Let's not let it go to waste. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ross. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. You heard about as clear of a presentation of the gospel that I think I've ever heard. It was presented to you very, very clearly. <clears throat> There's a decision that has to be made. You're going to make a decision tonight. You're either going to say, nope, I'm not going to do that. Then I want you to tell God right now, right there in that prayer, head bowed, eyes closed, say, nope, God, I don't want a thing to do with you. I want you to tell them that. That's pretty hard, isn't it? <laughs> but some of you, if you just get up and walk out of here, that's what you're saying in God's face. Not interested in what you did for me. I don't have to give you any more scripture than what you've heard. Brother Ross has covered it. You either have received him or you have not. I'm encouraging you with your head bowed and your eyes closed. And that's not between me and you, not between you and this church, not between you and Brother Ross, between you and God. And he's here tonight. God's obviously here tonight. God brought Brother Ross here. God directed him to share his word. He brought every one of you here tonight, whether you believe that or not. It's no mistake that you're here tonight. Not a coincidence. God brought you here. He kept you alive to this day to hear this message. Now you got a decision you got to make. 
head bowed, eyes closed, not looking around, nobody's looking at you, talk to God. And if you'll come sincerely and say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, who said yes to the cross for your sins and mine and the sins of the world, as Brother Ross shared, he will not cast you out. Jesus said, he that cometh to me, I will in no way cast out. No way. The King James says, no wise. That means no way will he cast you out. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what the devil's pumping into your head right now and saying, you did that. You, God ain't going to forgive you. Jesus paid it all. All to him we have sinned and left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. You have the decision to make. You're an individual here tonight. You're going to say yes or no. And I'm praying that you're going to say yes to the Lord Jesus. Heads bowed, eyes closed. And I'm going to pray with you. Father, thank you for your goodness to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you for your word that you've given to us. Thank you for Brother Ross and his dear wife and bringing them safe here and the message that he's presented tonight. I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to hearts in this place like only you can, like you spoke to many of our hearts one day. If there be one here tonight that's not yet trusted you, I pray that by your grace, by your spirit tonight, that one might come sincerely and say yes to you, receive you as Lord and Savior as you would desire. I ask these things in Christ's name, heads bowed, eyes still closed. I'm just a man. Brother Bissell is just a man. Him and I are standing here tonight before you. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. I would like for you tonight, if you, while you've been listening, have been spoken to in your heart, and you feel that God brought you here, you understood the message, and you want to get it settled with the Lord, and you want to be saved tonight. I'd like for you just that nobody's looking at you. I'd just like you to slip your hand up. You say, why do you want me to do that? Because I want to pray for you and I want to rejoice with you that God spoke to you. I'm not going to come get you. I'm not playing a trick. I promise you I won't chase you around here. But if God spoke to you, I just would be blessed to know that you came to this meeting tonight. God spoke to your heart. You want to get it settled once for all. And you'd like Brother Bissell and me to pray for you. Now, I'm not going. again, it's not a trick. I promise you I won't come get you. Is there anybody here tonight like that in this place? Just slip your hand up, slip it down. By raising your hand, you're just saying, Brother Cardi, I want to get that settled. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your hand. You can put it back down. I see it. Thank you. I won't do anything more to you than I did to him. I, I, he just raised his hand and said that he wanted to get it settled. I praise the Lord for him. I'm going to pray for him in just a minute. Anybody else? Anybody else here? Not sure that if you die tonight, you're going to heaven. Not sure you've gotten this thing settled. This is the most important time of your life right now. I beg you, don't, I can't make you, I wish I could, but you won't regret it. The Lord won't ever disappoint you. He's good. Doesn't mean it's going to be peaches, roses, and cream. Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation. I'm not telling you that, but you'll know that your sin is forgiven. You'll know you're on your way to heaven. You'll know that God transformed your life. You say, well, I can't change my life. You're right. And you look at that picture on that paper that we handed out a little while ago. Uh, that Believe me, I couldn't change mine either. <laughs> But the Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. God does the changing. He'll take care of that. You just come to him and say, I'm coming home. I've been running long enough, hard enough away. I'm coming home, Lord. I want to receive you. Is there anybody else with one other man that would just slip your hand up and say, yep, Brother Cardi, that's what I want for my life. That's what I want tonight. Anybody here? Anyone here? All right, let me make this real clear. You don't have to raise your hand to let me know. But you need to raise your heart before God. Now, if you're here and you're making that decision, just afraid to tell me, you think I'm going to come after you or something. If you're settling that tonight where you're sitting, I want you to tell somebody, somebody that brought you here, somebody that you know. You can come tell me after if you'd like. Tell Brother Ross, tell Brother Bissell, tell Brother Carmen, uh, Brother Chip, any, any of these men that spoke. Every one of these men have trusted Christ as their Savior. And it's a blessing to me. You know, it takes more of a man to live for Jesus than it does to walk out and reject them. It's not just a sissy. I used to think religion was for sissies and old ladies, yeah? Well, I'll tell you what, that's not a fact. Real men trust Christ. And there's some here tonight that I thank God for. Again, Father, I thank you for the one man who raised his hand tonight. Let me know that he wants to get this settled. I pray you'd give him courage to come and talk to one of us uh, at the close of this meeting that we might help him to see and know what you're doing in his life. 
And Lord, as I promised, I will not chase after him, but I pray he knows who he is. And I pray that if you've spoken to him, that he'll come and talk to us and let us show him from your word what you're doing in his life. And Lord, there may be others tonight in this place who have not raised their hand, but they know their need and they're wanting to get this settled. I pray that you would just bear down on them and help them to realize that they need to tell somebody that they're making this decision tonight, most important decision, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. I ask that you just be with us in all that we do tonight, and as we close this meeting, Lord, that your blessing would be upon it. I pray that you'd be with Brother Ross uh, through the night and that you'd uh, uh, bring us back tomorrow for a good day in church, that we'd hear the word preached as we have tonight, and, and uh, Lord, just draw us closer to you who we cannot see, but we know are real and closer to each other as we become brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Now, again, I'm going to encourage that one man. Nobody knows who he is, but talk to somebody tonight after we uh, break up and we're uh, going different directions. Now, here's what we're going to do. we got the door prizes. You don't want to miss that. And that's upstairs. If you go home and your name is drawn, you won't win the prize. We have a $100 gift card, three $50 gift cards, two $25 gift cards, and a raft of other prizes up there, like we always do. Uh, the folks have donated them. And so what we're going to do is we're going to let you go and go to the different rooms. The men's room, ladies' room down here is right there. Some of you probably already found it. Upstairs at the back of the auditorium in the hallway, there's another ladies' and men's room. And so you got all those places where you can do that. And so take care of that. And I will meet you in the auditorium at 20 minutes after 8. And we should be out of here by 9 o'clock like usual. How's that sound? All right? So you're dismissed. And take care of what you need to do. 20 minutes after 8, be in the auditorium for the door prizes. God bless you. Well, you should have brought it. Tell them you got to come and see it. Oh. Tell them I'm getting tired of hearing about that. Tell them I want to see him. I want to see him. He'd like this banquet. I know. Put the video on. Let me tell him. Where are you? Ben, ben, you should have been here. Tell him he a good meal, right? Churches are just for old ladies and sissies. Tell him I miss did you guys put your name in the thing? Yes. Oh, good. Yes, we did. Can you say Papa? I told the lady I'd watch him. Here, you take that out. Take this one. Right there, just in case. Make sure I get these back. Okay. Just in case. Can you take that up? ones right by me and bottom of